Welcome to the Lens of History. You are with Luke Herbert, speaking with special guests and placing the microscope on current and historical events. Welcome, listeners, to this latest installment of The Lens of History, and I am your host, Luke Herbert, and joining me in the studio today is the noted Alaskan author, Justin Oldham. How are you doing today, Justin? Doing well, Luke, and glad to be here. Well, and, you know, of late, I've noted reports in the the media of, you know, the, the Russian Air Force sending aircraft off Alaska, which is very much reminiscent of the Cold War, but... That brings me to what today's topic is, and today we're going to examine the efforts the Russian government is undertaking to modernize that country's military forces. And and along those lines, they have an active modernization program underway for their Air Force, Navy, and Army. So just before we get underway, does any of this surprise you at all, Justin? Fundamentally, no. Here we are in late September 2014. The Russians have recently acquired Crimea, and now they're in the process of shaking eastern Ukraine loose from uh, central Ukraine. And now Vladimir Putin has been talking about the Pan-Asian Federation, which is essentially a new, modern, contemporary version of the old Soviet Union. And for the last 10 years, Russia has been rearming, modernizing, re-equipping its army, navy, and air force very slowly by degrees. So fundamentally, there's really no surprise to any of this. The only thing that should be of concern to us here in 2014 is that the the proverbial pot is getting ready to boil over because the conflict in the Ukraine, which we've talked about in a previous episode of this program, uh, is very reminiscent of the Czechoslovakian conflict, which, which led to the Second World War. And I think, you know, speaking of the Ukraine and Eastern Europe, I think that's the the right place to start this discussion. And on the whole, the Russians are modernizing their Cold War era military hardware. But I think it's worth starting out with their land forces. And I think the the Russians had always planned to modernize their land forces going back to the late 80s and early 90s, but they simply ran out of money. And so they're doing what they planned to do basically 20 years ago, you know, in the present and leading up to the year 2000. 20, which is frequently going to be mentioned on this program. So now when I look at the Russians today, I personally have seen nothing to suggest that they have changed their their philosophy or their doctrines in terms of how they would fight any future land war in Europe or any future conflict at all. And and that is basically just to use the sheer weight of numbers with uh, equipment like tanks that is just good enough to get them through and basically swamp the, the Western NATO powers in Europe. So bearing that in mind, how does this then play out in terms of the current situation in Europe? You know, we see the likes of the UK and the European members of NATO and perhaps associated members, they are reducing their defense spending while the Russians are increasing their spending and modernization. Well, actually, I do see that there will be uh, fundamental changes in uh, modern mobile tactics. If there is war with Russia, I do think that there will be uh, uh, important strategic and tactical differences Uh, between Soviet doctrine and what you can think of as modern 21st century Russian doctrine. But ultimately, what's happening here has not been hard to predict because since the end of the Cold War, there has been a global power vacuum. The United States has been the world's only superpower. And as one American president after the next, after the next, after the next has stepped away from what American foreign policy used to be. Uh, Various world leaders have uh, seen fit to execute their own agendas. In this specific case, since we are talking about Russia, what's been going on here? 
in the post Berlin Wall world. Okay, the Berlin Wall collapses uh, December 26th, 1989. I think that is the approximate date. That's uh, that, that that's when it comes down. The Soviet Union is no more by 1991. As Bill Clinton comes into office, he's our country's first Cold War president, and the first thing he wants to do is cash in what he calls the peace dividend. That involves the the demobilization of American military forces, and so a number of our uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force units are, are demobilized as our soldiers retire. New recruitments are not required to, uh, to replace. The, the the people that go on into civilian life and things th- the world the world changes and we forgot about Russia but the Russians haven't forgotten about Russia because their economy collapsed and uh, everything fell apart in an extremely bad way for them because the Soviet system which stayed intact through force of arms and through political will, collapsed after seven decades. And men like Vladimir Putin, very ruthless people indeed, came to power and through a variety of political maneuvers and programs and just plain ruthless behavior, they have rebuilt what you can think of as modern Russia and today, so as they look at the situation for them, it's still an, an uphill fight. And as they reconstruct what in their mind was, they are still putting their house in order. They are still reacquiring what they had. That is their particular perspective on this whole thing. So while the rest of us are out here pursuing what is all kinds of great, kind, and wonderful about the 21st century, these guys are playing catch-up and they're trying to get back some of what they lost. So this is this is the larger context of what I see. So what comes next? To put this in a nutshell, the current Russian government has two choices. They fight, in which case there's going to be another war in Europe, or they face eventual collapse because their current economy is is what's called an oligarchy. It's a a small, extremely rich, extremely powerful people control just about everything. And that's a throwback to the old Soviet system, centralized authority, centralized uh, production, everything. And and while they have tried to get back of some of what they've lost, you know, the old saying goes that you can never go home. So that's, that's where they are right now. The only way they're actually going to get what we think of as democracy today is uh, they're going to have to collapse and they're going to have to rebuild with a more democratic tendencies. But right now, as I see it, that doesn't happen. Ultimately, I think, borrowing your lens of history here as we look into the future, I think they have to fight or they have to die. And the last thousand years of recorded history tells us that authoritarian regimes always choose to fight. Well, ultimately, if I had to summarize what's going on in Russia and will continue to go on, they have switched from communism, what you saw in the Soviet Union, to fascism. And the same has happened in China. And I think ultimately, if I had to draw parallels with fascism in Nazi Germany, in terms of having the, the hierarchy that runs Russia, you have a whole lot of industrialists in Russia that are profiting and will profit from Russian rearmament in the same way German industry profited from it in the 1930s and you know you can also draw the parallel along a little bit further with you know the industrialists in Germany doing very well while the the workers simply went to work in the in the factories building the tanks and but you, you mentioned how the Russians were flat broke in the 90s and you know entering the next decade after that which we've you know we've just left and it brings up an interesting point that I think is just worth touching on here in that period but 
in particular the Russian Navy, they kept sending their submarines, like the Kursk notably to sea, even though maintenance had been grossly underdone. And what they were doing is they were maintaining institutional knowledge of how to run and main, you know, even run, basically run and keep their submarines in service. And they were, you know, they were still conducting training exercises. So bearing this in mind, how important was that to the future of the Russian military, you know, keeping what they could going in that desolate time period for them? Well, you began the program by mentioning the fact that, uh, that the Russian Air Force is beginning to test American air defenses here in Alaska. They are flying uh, uh, Tupolev-95 uh, bombers up to the edge of American airspace, uh, being escorted by uh, MiG-29s currently. They, these are eventually going to be replaced by MiG-31s. Uh, and I mention that just for the sake of posterity, because once this podcast is uploaded to the internet, theoretically, it lives forever. So, uh, But the, the, the TU-95 is a Soviet-era relic that is still just good enough to get the job done. And what's interesting about it is that uh, when those airplanes get close to Alaska, you can actually hear them something close to 700 miles inland because they are just so loud. They are so noisy that the sound of their propellers uh, carries a, a very long way. Now, back in uh, b back in the day during the Cold War, the the, the Americans uh, had their own counterpart. Where they used to fly these uh, missions called it was called Operation Chrome Dome, and it lasted from approximately 1960 to approximately 1998. We had uh, and, and by the 1990s, we had B-52s escorted by F-15s, and they would fly out of places like Eielson and, and Elmendorf here in the here in the Anchorage area. And and both sides do these things to maintain what is called operational readiness. And in the post-Soviet period. Period. Submarines like the Kursk were still going to sea, even though there was no enemy for them to fight, in the same way that United States Navy nuclear submarines are going to sea today here in Tuthine. There's no enemy for them to fight either, but they go to sea and they train to maintain what is called operational readiness, and they have, they have simulated missions using computers that they carry out on a regular basis, and it's worth noting that while their equipment is not updated as often as Western equipment is, it still is updated occasionally. And while it may be 20 and 30 years old, they are still training to use it, which means they are what is called technically proficient. That means that they know how to use it under a wide variety of circumstances. And as anybody who's ever served in the military knows, any piece of technology only has to be just good enough to get the job done. The AK-47 is uh, is more than half a century old, and it's not as uh, it's not as a slick, dandy, and brand new as a lot of the the systems that have been put into the field in the last five or ten years. But it's still just good enough to get the job done. And when we when when we look at navies around the world, one of the things that you see is that the Russian are not the only ones who have these older systems that are just good enough. So that that's something to, that that's something to keep in mind. But the uh, the the Kursk is not just a tragedy. Uh, it it's uh, it's an example of the fact that even in the post-Soviet period. Long before anybody ever heard the name Vladimir Putin, the Russians were still making an active effort to keep their technical proficiency. And the logical follow-up to that question, and this is what concerns me, and it concerns me about the New Zealand Defence Force, even if it is just in terms of our operational capability for peacekeeping, is that as the Western powers generally are spending less on defence, and they are you know, they're withdrawing from different theatres like Afghanistan, just as one example, I, I think the danger is that we see operational readiness slip badly, whereby the Russians and the Chinese 
countries and, and to a, a smaller degree even the Iranians via their involvement in Syria or the civil war in Syria to be more accurate are, are gaining operational readiness so when or if a future conflict does break out does this not mean that the western powers basically go into the conflict with one hand tied behind their back? Fundamentally, yes, although there is one thing that I would care to take issue with. Uh, in terms of actual operational readiness, uh, the Americans, the British, and the French, who are playing a larger role in these things today, their militaries do maintain active training schedules, very busy training schedules. And so within the, within the context of the forces they actually maintain, they do have good operational readiness. The problem that they have is that their actual manpower pool is a shrinking. At the height of the Cold War, the United States uh, military maintained 2.2 million men under arms. This was a, a, a combined total of our regular armed forces plus our reserves plus our National Guard units. And now today we, we field a force that is approximately half that size. Most of the NATO units today uh, that are in, that are in, in existence right now, and, and that includes uh, Germany, France, United Kingdom, and all the other 27 member nations of the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, most of these militaries are cut down by an equivalent amount. That means in the post-war period, Western armies have shrunk by a total of 50%. These are still highly qualified, well-equipped, technically proficient forces, but the total numbers of troops and tanks and guns have been reduced substantially so that in the event of an actual war, they go into combat with fewer numbers. And as we look at the Russian situation, while the Russians have older equipment, they have more of it. While the Russians have an army that is perhaps less technically proficient because they have smaller budgets and they don't train as much, they have more men under arms than their Western counterparts do, and that's going to matter if this thing actually devolves into a shooting war. And then just shifting the focus of the program to the parts of the world the Russian military will be able to threaten. And my, my thinking basically is that Russia's land forces are, pose a threat to Western Europe and the, the NATO powers that are based in Europe. And they also could go southwards towards the Middle East in the event of a conflict. So is there any reason really to think that the, the Russians might sort of go beyond those geographical boundaries with their land forces? The Russians have no need to go into the Middle East any further than Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and, uh, and Chechnya. The, essentially, the, the, the southern Caucasus region of their country. That's been their traditional border. They have uh, xenophobic tendencies, which will cause them to want to stray no further than that. And they are sufficiently blessed with enough natural resources, iron and oil among them, that they really won't want to go beyond that. They're going to want to use the Caucasus mountain as a, the Caucasus mountain range rather, as a natural barrier. Because in the years to come, as extremism becomes more and more of a factor in their country, one of the things that's going to uh, motivate them to fight is uh, the, the question of extremism. If they're not in a position to develop their own resources and, ex and export them to the rest of the world, ultimately they're going to they're, they're gonna have to fight. And the only natural gateway for them to do this is the planes that lead them to Western Europe. That would be chiefly my argument as well. What 
I think would take the Russians potentially beyond those boundaries is the Suez Canal. If a war does blow up in Western Europe and they will be loosely aligned with the Islamic extremists in the Middle East, I do think that they may send down some troops, a bit like their version of the Africa Corps, to the Middle East to, you know, make sure that what you might term loosely as friendly forces maintain control of the Suez Canal, which is a key shipping artery in terms of moving supplies, you know, war material to Europe. But I think equally, perhaps more likely, they would simply just supply Iran and other other aligned forces with military hardware and have them do the fighting. And then perhaps or perhaps not, they'd become like the Italians in World War II. That just have, that remains to be seen. But then just switching the focus to basically Alaska and the you know the, the mainland United States, I would think that then the Russian military you know is unlikely, or they actually flat out won't invade those areas. But because of the development of missiles and modern weaponry in the post-war period that you and I have discussed and has been well documented, certainly I would think with you sitting up there in Alaska that at least the Russian uh, Air Force and the, the naval platforms that carry what amounts to cruise missiles would be what the U.S. military planners and thinkers would be closely examining. In recent years, an author by the name of Vaughn Hepner has written a series of books uh, titled Invasion Alaska, in which he's uh, theorized that it was Chinese uh, that would invade rather than the Russians. But back during the Cold War, there was actually some concern about the possibility of a Russian invasion. There was a, a very popular movie, it was actually called World War III, that featured a Russian invasion of Alaska. This, uh, I believe it was uh, 1978, I think it was. It might have been. I, I stand to be corrected on this, but Rock Hudson played the President of the United States, and in that movie, the Russian Arctic troops crossed into Alaska to capture the, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Fundamentally, in today's world, the Russians have no strategic need to invade Alaska because uh, pretty much they, they have everything we have. They've got the coal. They've got the oil. The only things that uh, we are likely to suffer from here are naval blockade and strategic weapon attacks simply because we're likely to see the buildup of uh, logistical supply hubs and strategic air bases that in the event of a larger conflict with the Russians, they would want to knock out. So we might have their bombers in our airspace. We might have their cruise missiles in our skies. But beyond that, it's unlikely that we're actually going to have their troops on our soil. So uh, I, I, I think I can pretty much rest easily here in the city of Anchorage. But if if, uh, if if we want to take a look at the the historical implications of all this the the thing that fascinates me is that the current situation with the potential reconstruction of the old Soviet Union makes me wonder if to a certain extent, this isn't unfinished business from the Second World War. Do you just want to allude a little bit on the unfinished business from the Second World War, just before I move on to the, the Indian and Pacific Oceans where the Russians are capable of deploying military forces? At the end of the Second World War, uh, American General George Patton got himself into a lot of political hot water by suggesting that the German army should be rearmed, reconstituted, and uh, put back in the field so that they could help us march on Moscow. And that his thinking at the time was part of the anti-communist sentiment of the day. There was a political decision made between London and Washington. It was the choice of the big bad versus the little bad. Which do you like more, which do you hate less? Ultimately, Roosevelt and Churchill were not fans of communism and they were not fans of fascism, but 
Hitler was on the verge of taking over a large slice of the world, and Stalin probably would have liked to do it, but he got beat to the punch. So in the post-World War II world, the simple fact of the matter is that there was still a bloodthirsty conqueror in our midst. And while we, uh, we, we can debate the question of Putin's psychology, the simple fact of the matter is that Russia has been and still is a, uh, uh, which you would, the technical, the technical term for this in political science is a resurgent state. They are still a nation on the rise. And while they have had more than one phase of empire, you can say that because of their resurgent nationalism, they're going through this new phase of empire again. And because this is happening at a time when the rest of the world is not ready to, to, to stand up against it, to push back against it, it's possible to make the argument from a historian's perspective that this is, to a certain extent, unfinished business from World War II. All right, and just before I wrap up, I just want to touch on the Indian and Pacific Oceans because the Russian Navy and Air Force is very capable of deploying to those areas of the world and purely fails to take a, an Australian in his own perspective. That's what you need to keep an eye on. You need to keep an eye on the modernization of the Russian naval and air forces and you need to then consider how far south they would deploy in any conflict and you've also got to bear in mind a lot of the world's commerce travels through asia and the indian ocean so that is just some food for thought for the listeners who are living and tuning in from the southern hemisphere and thank you for joining us today justin well thank you much for having me you have been listening to the lens of history with luke herbert 